All right, it is 6.30, so I think we'll get started now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the second week of mini med school this year. We're really excited to have you guys here today for a session on outdoor health and tick-borne illnesses. Um, to get started, it is my pleasure to introduce one of my MD-PhD classmates, Camille Morgan, as the student speaker. Camille is a Chapel Hill native and wanted to make sure to note that she's been coming here since before it was renovated and all cool looking back in the day. Um, Camille graduated from UNC undergrad in 2015 and spent the next few years working at the NIH and Johns Hopkins before coming to UNC in 2018 to start an MD-PhD program. Camille is actually less than a month away from getting her PhD in epidemiology in the Gilling School of Public Health, where she's been working with the infectious disease malaria group, um, specifically working out at the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, Camille's gonna give an awesome warm up talk. So everybody give her a round of applause. So hi everyone, um, as Kevin said, my name is Camille. Um, I spent about 25% of my PhD living in the DR Congo um, where I studied hepatitis B transmission, um, but I work with a malaria research group um, at UNC. And so thinking about malaria as a vector-borne disease is relevant to our, our talk tonight. Um, and it's exciting to sort of switch gears and think about US-based um, health. Okay, so what do we mean when we're talking about a vector-borne disease? So vectors are any living agent that can carry and transmit, usually an infectious pathogen, to a living organism. So we're gonna focus on human diseases and we'll talk a little bit about diseases in pets as well. Um, so think ticks, mosquitoes, fleas, other types of um, arthropods um, that usually carry a, a bacterium, but also virus or parasite and can cause disease. Um, uh, the life cycles of both vectors and these infectious pathogens can be very complicated. On the right, this is a diagram of the life cycle of the brown dog tick, which carries um, the bacterium that causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever, one of the tick-borne diseases that we see sometimes here in North Carolina. Um, as you can see, there's different stages of the life cycle of the tick from larvae to adult tick. And the tick can carry this bacterium at different stages and remain infectious to humans as well as dogs. Um, so we're gonna focus on tick-borne diseases, but I also wanna talk briefly about mosquito-borne diseases here in the US. So this map shows cases over time of infections that came from mosquitoes. So this includes everything from um, Zika virus, chikungunya virus, West Nile virus, but also malaria. And these cases include both locally acquired infections as well as travel associated. So um, there's not very many mosquito-borne infections in the US, um, but as we think about a warming climate, the habitat of these vectors can expand. And if enough um, infections get reintroduced into these settings, you could think about more frequent transmission um, leading to potentially endemicity. Um, I highlight this because last summer for the first time in several decades, we had local cases of malaria transmission. So malaria was eradicated from the US several decades ago, um, but we've had malaria cases since then from returning travelers. So if someone goes to an endemic area or an area where there's malaria at a high enough prevalence, um, gets bitten by a mosquito that can carry the parasite, and then returns to the US and then develops symptoms. We often will see these cases, but this was the first time where we saw cases in humans that had not traveled. And so this can happen when someone returns from travel, got infected while traveling, and then locally is bitten by a mosquito that can carry the parasite. And then that mosquito goes on to bite someone else. And so that second person are these locally acquired transmission cases. So they never traveled, but they were bitten by the same mosquito that had bitten someone who had traveled. And so you can imagine as more um, of these vectors can spread throughout the US as different habitats become more hospitable, this could, and, and, and as people are traveling more frequently, this can become um, more of a concern. Okay, so shifting gears to talk, to focus more on tick-borne diseases. So I'm showing maps of some of the more common tick-borne diseases here in the United States. So this includes Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, Lyme disease, as well as some diseases that you might not have heard about. They're not as common here, um, but ehrlichiosis, which is in North Carolina, 
as well as tularemia, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. So as you can see from these maps, um, we see pretty variable patterns spatially. So it matters where you are and then where you've traveled to in terms of what infections could be more or less likely if you were to de develop symptoms, which we'll talk more about in a second. And then on the far right, I'm highlighting a map of some of the alpha-gal cases, which Dr. Commons is gonna talk more about tonight. Um, I also wanna note, um, I'm highlighting some of the diseases in humans that are caused by an infectious pathogen, but some of the disease is caused by the immune response, which is what Dr. Commons is gonna talk about. Um, in terms of the uh, infections that can be more common or commonly seen in North Carolina, we think about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, ehrlichiosis, and Lyme disease. Okay, so shared some about what these diseases are, but what, what do they actually look like in humans? And unfortunately, a lot of these symptoms are somewhat vague and nonspecific to each disease. So this includes what we typically think of as flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, muscle aches. Um, this picture here shows this characteristic rash of Lyme disease, but sometimes this rash could occur, say, on your scalp where you may not notice it, or maybe someone doesn't experience the rash. And so these clinical symptoms may not always point towards a specific infection. Um, the other thing that happens is we might not notice if we got bitten by a tick. We might not have ever seen it or noticed a bite. As you can see, some of these ticks um, are very small. And so sometimes the bite itself can go unnoticed. Um, and then secondly, that can complicate a lot of the diagnosis is that um, the infection or the disease in humans can be exacerbated by the immune response. So maybe you've experienced yourself or someone you know who's gone through the process of getting diagnosed with Lyme disease. Many of these symptoms can occur several months after original infection, long after the bacterium itself is detectable. And so that can really complicate this picture because symptoms can vary between people and then we may not be able to find traces of the pathogen itself. Okay, so not a great picture, but what, what, how can we avoid this? Uh, we don't have a vaccine for a lot of these infections and so we think about preventing the bite itself. Um, so our hiker friend here, uh, is setting out on a hike in the woods where ticks often habitate. Um, and it's important to think about covering your skin and tucking in your clothing to prevent access um, for ticks to get under your skin. Um, use repellent can be very um, valuable for preventing bites. And then ticks often, I don't have a diagram of this, but they can often be on like taller grasses and then can jump onto you as you walk by. And so um, walking on trails can help avoid this. Um, and then always checking for ticks after, um, after hiking. Um, it's easy to remember going for a big adventure to think about prevention, but sometimes in our own backyard, we need to think about this too. And so um, some things that we can do is still use, um, you know, long gloves, long pants um, when working in the yard. Um, but there's also other strategies with landscaping that can help sort of protect from tick bites. And these include using wood chips. So cedar is a repellent for a lot of, um, not just ticks, but um, it helps with ticks. And so creating a barrier between the woods and your home. Um, but then also because ticks can live on deer, it's important to keep deer away from spaces that you also may overlap. And there's various plants that um, maybe many of you are gardeners and have experienced deer eating your plants and have thought about what plants uh, will keep deer away. I know I have certainly, but here's an added benefit. Okay, so you did all that you could to prevent a tick bite, um, but you still found one. Um, what do you do about it? Um, so first, remain calm, um, but find tweezers and firmly grab the body of the tick and just pull straight up. So don't twist the body, don't try to pry the tick up from your skin. And then contrary to any sort of popular belief that may be out there, don't use a match to, to sort of press on the tick and then get it to let go. Um, don't use nail polish or anything else. Um, this can actually cause the tick to expel more of its guts, including the infectious pathogen into you. Um, and so by just removing it can, can lead to a lower dose if it happened to be infected. 
Um, and then dispose of the, the tick. Um, I think flushing down the toilet is one of the more common ones. Um, I have memories as a kid with my mom lighting a match not to get it off of me, but to light the tick and then drop the match and the tick into the toilet. I don't know if that's <laughs> still uh, recommended anymore, but proper disposal is also important. Um, and then just be aware of any symptoms that might develop after this. Um, lastly, just we focus a lot on disease in humans, but our dogs or our pets may be in the woods more frequently than us. And so how can we um, prevent tick bites um, in our um, animal friends? Uh, so checking regularly uh, can be important. Here are some of the sites where ticks like to um, hide out. Um, and then dogs also do have a topical or a chewable agent that can sort of uh, repel the tick from biting, but these do have to be applied monthly to maintain efficacy. Um, and then maintaining a relationship with um, vets is also important, not just for any treatment of symptoms that develop, but also for tracking diseases that are happening. Um, Tick-borne diseases are sort of an intersection of the natural environment and our human environment. And as that overlap changes with time, we need to think about um, the overlap and that includes working with veterinarians. Um, so that's all that I have. I'll, I'm happy to take any questions now or um, turn it over to Dr. Commons. Yes. <laughs> Coming at home, my mother was in the hospital. She had a tick and a spoon, and it poured into it. And she didn't see it. So after about, I don't know, a month or so, like, you know, like a tick. So could it be the type of a tick? I mean, he was so lucky. I mean, eventually we had, we had first tick. Right, right. Yeah, well, it's a great point. So. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but the tick is one aspect, but the tick is what's carrying some of these infections. Mm -hmm. So it could be that the tick didn't have any of these parasites or bacteria, um, and then he didn't develop any sort of other immune responses um, from this. So so sometimes, yes, yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I mean, living in DR Congo last year, I thought a lot about malaria transmission, but not every mosquito has malaria, um, but you don't want the one bite from the mosquito that does have the pathogen. So yeah, yeah. Any other questions or we can proceed? Okay, thank you all. Take a quick five minute break, letting bathroom if they need to, and then we'll pick up with Dr. Poppins. All right. Now that we're all back, I would be honored to introduce Dr. Scott Commons. Dr. Commons is the UN Distinguished Professor of Medicine in the Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology at UNC. Dr. Commons did his MD-PhD at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, and then went up to the University of Virginia for residency and fellowship training. Dr. Commons is an incredible member of the faculty here and is a world leader in the research and treatment of alpha-gal allergy, which I'm sure he'll be talking about some today. And let's all give him a round of applause as he takes the stage. All right, thank you. Pleasure to be here. I'm gonna try to not have to hold this the whole time. So my plan is to say something interesting because I imagine that we're all at various different levels of, of understanding and, and science and medicine. So um, if you, if, if at any point I am not clear or you're lost, please say something because I unfortunately make assumptions about, you know, when you do stuff every day, right? You think there's a level of familiarity and, and so, um, just interrupt me, but the uh, so this is appropriately titled "A Walk in the Woods." It's actually from a faculty member at Oklahoma State University. These are female Lone Star ticks, and you know that because they have the white spot on them. Male Lone Star ticks to me look like any other tick; they're just brown. 
Um, but this is double-sided tape, not a bad way to obviously prevent ticks from getting on you. So I actually added the, uh, the allergy portion because I figured they wouldn't have asked me to come here if they don't want to talk a little bit about allergies. And in the world of science, as you may know, it, it, it literally takes a village. It takes a tremendous amount of people to do good work. So this is just to say what I'm showing you, it, I'm here talking, but there's a, a, a fleet of people behind me. And this is John Grisham, the author. You may recognize him. I don't know if you remember, but back in the day when, when we actually got like newspapers, on Sundays, the USA Today would have this sort of glossy section called the Weekender. And it would be a, about, you know, stuff that's coming up, whatever. And this is the Weekender from uh, two th July 10th, 2011. And Mr. Grisham was, uh, a new book was coming out or something. Uh, and so they had these little interview, right, where he, they ask him a question and, and, um, they ask him, you know, what, what's your favorite food, right? So he says, I have this weird food allergy that started about five years ago. So I can't eat beef or pork, which is probably pretty healthy. We eat a lot of fish and fowl. I'd kill for a cheeseburger though, or a big steak. So this sort of relates, not sort of, this completely relates to what I'm gonna tell you about. Um, because at the University of Virginia, I was training in allergy and immunology at the time we were starting to see a couple of patients turns out that mr grisham actually lived in charlottesville at the time but he was not our patient but we were seeing a few patients who had a similar story and they would say look i think i'm allergic to beef but it's weird the reactions don't happen right away so people would say look i i, I thought i was allergic to beef but it's nothing happens right away i, I maybe i eat a cheeseburger and I go to bed and four hours later, I'm itching and I have hives. And then people would say, you know, I, I actually thought it was beef. So I tried to kind of challenge myself and nothing happened. So I thought, well, maybe it's not beef. So then I ate another steak and sure enough, I got hives again, delayed. And it was consistently inconsistent. It begins to mark the allergy. People would tell you, that it doesn't happen every time and they thought maybe it had gone away or they had a mistake in what they thought they were allergic to, but then they try again and they have reactions. Sometimes they would say, it's really bad. Like, got to go to the hospital, feel have trouble breathing. And other times, maybe just some itching. So we would, we would get this story of kind of back and forth symptoms. And then a few patients, because we didn't really know what we were dealing with at this point, a few patients said, look, I've, I've so convinced it's beef that I've really cut beef out of my diet. And now I'm eating more pork. And I think it's starting to happen with pork too. And there were a few patients and I'm, I mean, we're talking like six or eight total. So about two or three told us, I'm so convinced of beef and pork that I'm now eating lamb and it's happening with lamb as well. And this is, in the, in the world of food allergy this is, or allergy in general, this is very unique because these were adults. And the general thought is if you've made it to adulthood and you're not allergic to a major food group that you've been eating for three, four decades, then you're good to go. Your immune system sees that antigen or that allergen and it does not make an allergic immune response. So this was definitely something different. And as allergists, what we like to do is skin test people, right? That's when you go to the allergist, this is what you expect. So this is a lancet and you can see it's got a little tiny point on the end. And this is sort of our typical testing. We would, um, this would be called skin prick testing or scratch testing. The, there's a positive here. It's kind of um, a little bit maybe washed out on the screen, but the positive up top is histamine. So we have to put histamine on someone's skin to make sure that they haven't been taking their Allegra or whatnot so that they can actually do the test. So you need a positive control. That's what the histamine is. And this would be the beef test. This would be chicken, lamb, pork, turkey. CO is codfish. And on this side would be dust mite. There's two different types of dust mite, cockroach, cat, dog, and grass. And I can tell you, if you try to convince a hunter in central North Carolina or central Virginia 
that he or she cannot eat beef or pork because they have a tiny little red spot on this, it won't work. This is really not positive testing. That's what a positive tends to look like. You can see maybe the dog and cat are positive, but, but that's not sufficiently positive. So the question that I kind of wanted to think, to, to explain and have us think about is, you know, what's happening on the surface of the skin, right? What is it about, since we're in mini med school, what is it about skin testing? What are we, what are we actually testing? So this is an allergy cell and there within the allergy cells, mast cells are in our tissues and basophils start with a B, basophils circulate in the blood. Both are kind of the, the predominant allergy cells, but within these cells, we have basically the body store of histamine and histamine makes us itch, makes us get hives. That's why when we have allergic stuff, we take an antihistamine. So on the surface of these allergy cells, we'll sit receptors that's shown here in green and then in the world of allergy what the the three letters to know are ige that means allergic class of antibody so in the receptor sits this y-shaped molecule and that's ige so if you happen to be allergic to cats we would an allergist might say you have ige to cat dander same if you're allergic to ragweed or cockroach you have ige to those things the way the system works and the way what we're doing on the prior slide with the skin test is this is your allergen. So we put allergen on the surface of the skin, the mast cells that are in the skin, if they have IgE that recognizes, for example, the cat extract that we're scratching with, then that cat extract will cross-link. And that's the critical thing in the field of allergy. You gotta cross-link these receptors. And then that drives this histamine release. So if you're allergic to cat, you have IgE to cat, we put this cat allergen on your skin, it crosslinks IgE, and then that signals eventually for histamine to be released. So that's what we are doing with skin testing. So I showed you this. We would not have called this positive. So if someone comes in and said, look, I've, I've got this story, I'm allergic to beef, pork, and lamb, at least I think I am. We do some skin testing, doesn't really show much there. But if we dilute some of those extracts and do basically like a, a Good. It comes to the up. I'm sure you'd be glad to. Um, so we dilute some of these same extracts and basically do like a PPD or TB test where we put a tiny bit of the extract under the skin. So you can, you can appreciate now you have the patient's attention because this really looks like you're allergic to beef, pork, and lamb, but there's nothing showing up to turkey, chicken, or dust mite. The positives are a little off to the side. There's a negative control. We call this testing on the right intradermal testing. We don't do it very much for food allergy, but we didn't know what we were dealing with in, er in the mid 2000s. So it was a natural progression to try to see if we could figure out what these patients were telling us. Then we had to think about, well, why all of a sudden are, are adults becoming allergic to three different meats? That really doesn't make much sense. So if you take a step back, basically the entire allergy field is predicated on the idea that, that allergens are proteins. So if you think about being allergic to cat or dog or dust, you're allergic to some protein within those various organisms or antigens. And it, it was one of those things where we, we try to think about, you know, what would be a protein on, on a cow that would also be the same thing on a pig, that would also be the same thing on sheep. And it, it just didn't make intuitive sense to us that that was really what was happening. There certainly are some that are common, but they're not necessarily things that would be consumed. And what we, what we really decided or sort of in our reading kind of figured out that a, there are conserved molecules between these various species. But one of the things that kept coming up in our reading was this sugar called alpha-gal. It is 
galactose alpha-1,3 galactose is the long name. But basically, alpha-gal is a sugar that's present in all lower mammals. But as humans, we actually don't have it. So it is alpha-gal technically is this linkage of two galactose molecules in space in an alpha-1,3 form. So the chemists here would, would acknowledge this. As, as a, not a chemist, to me, I can just tell you it's two galactose molecules that sit in an arrangement that the chemists call alpha-1,3. But it is immunogenic. So our immune systems respond to it. In fact, all immunocompetent humans, assuming that none of us in here have immune deficiency, we all currently have IgA, IgM, and IgG, which are three main immunoglobulin isotypes. We have those two alpha-gal. We think that it's the bacteria in our intestines that trigger that immune response, but everybody has at least those three uh, classes of antibody to alpha-gal. The people I'm gonna tell you about, they make IgE to alpha-gal. And we think that that happens from tick bites. So that's basically the part of the story. As we were thinking about alpha-gal, we also noticed that if you're blood group B, you kind of have this alpha-gal, but you have this extra fucose moiety there. And, and blood group A doesn't have alpha-gal because they have a gal knack, the square on the top. So part of what we were thinking too is like, gosh, I wonder if any of these newly identified patients, is the blood group gonna be important if this alpha-gal thing is correct? So we made a test where we put the various allergens shown here uh, across the bottom on basically what we call a solid phase. So you could take someone's serum or blood and put it over this sponge material with the, al with the allergens on the sponge material and look to see what was binding. And that's shown here on the y-axis. So this was just our first few patients, right? And so what we were able to find, these are the patients who are saying that they think they were allergic to beef, pork, lamb, et cetera. It didn't happen very, very, um, very quick after eating and it was inconsistent, but they tested positive by this blood test we'd been working on to have IgE to the sugar, alpha-gal. And when we did their beef, pork, and lamb tests, they were also positive. So this is our limit of detection, the dotted line here. So a few of them didn't have uh, positive to beef, pork, and lamb. Almost all of them were negative, so below the limit of detection to chicken, turkey, and fish. And as mammals, it turns out many of them tested positive to cat and dog. But what was striking is they didn't say that they were allergic to cat or dog, meaning they didn't have any sense of, of a dander allergy, right? If you know people that are allergic to cats in particular, and they go into a, a neighbor's home or a friend's home, they may not even have to see that there's a cat there. They can tell you, there's a cat here somewhere, I know. Cat is an incredibly strong allergen. So these patients were testing positive, but they didn't have, the, they didn't have a dander allergy per se. It turns out it's just because cat and dog are mammals as well. So there is some of this alpha-gal on the test for beef, pork, lamb, also on the test, for cat and dog would be the same if we had a test for deer or squirrel or goat. They would, all of them would show up positive. So this led to a publication in 2009. Um, this was me during fellowship and we only had 24 patients, two dozen people, Central Virginia and Southern Missouri. And it was basically, hey, I think I'm allergic to beef and pork, lamb, et cetera. My blood test is positive, my skin test is positive, and oh, by the way, it takes three to six hours before anything happens, and our usual skin test I showed you didn't pick it up very well. We had to do that intradermal testing. And this sort of started the, the field that we now think about as, as alpha-gal syndrome or alpha-gal allergy. But I thought that the next thing because that was all report. These were just patients saying, look, I think I'm allergic to this stuff. And, and yes, we had worked out the blood test, but we really hadn't 
challenged anyone in that initial publication. So I'm going to show you some pictures from the food challenges, but I also include this because I'm going to show you adults, but it happens in kids too. So as much as I'm going to talk about adults, I just want to take the opportunity to say this, this whole tick bite meat allergy thing happens in kiddos as well. And it looks just like the allergy in adults. So we tried a lot of different things before we settled on a, a pork sausage challenge. We tried prosciutto. It turns out that the patients would say, the fattier that the meat is, the more I have episodes or reactions. And so I thought, well, we should, you know, it's delayed. So we need to start in the morning. So what will people eat this kind of fatty in the morning? So prosciutto seemed like a reasonable idea, but I think you couldn't eat enough prosciutto to, <laughs> to really cause the reaction. So for many of these patients, it's not a, it's not a trace thing. It is for some people, but many people, they have to eat the whole steak or the whole hamburger. It turns out it's hard to find a good steak or hamburger in the morning at 8 a.m. that we could use in the allergy clinic, but pork sausage works great. So we use Jimmy Dean original pork sausage patties, um, still looking for sponsorship, but they haven't, haven't done that yet. We try to get people to eat two or three is the ideal amount. Um, and this is actually a before photo from a gentleman who came in to do one of the food challenges with us because we really felt like we needed to convince people that the reactions are delayed. It, it can be delayed. It's not, it, it's not like milk, egg, or peanut, or tree nut where it happens so fast. It, it is IgE, but it can be delayed. So this is a before photo. You can see his blood test was positive based on uh, those units. We also think about something called a total IgE, which is just all of the allergic response your body makes. And we would, we would put an IV in just for caution, you know, in case something bad happened, we could resuscitate and give fluids and all that kind of stuff. But we also took blood every hour through the IV, which I'll show you, I think that becomes important. And this gentleman, he had driven with his family probably about four or five hours to come and, and see us. And after about six hours, really nothing had happened. He had a little, a, a small area of itch, uh, basically on his lower back. It's not shown here, because again, this was before we started the food challenge. But, so I let him go. And that was, it turns out not, not I shouldn't have done that, but we were still very early into this. And about a half hour later, he called me um, from the road. I guess they weren't quite that far away probably closer to two hours away. So he called me from the road and said, that place that was itching a little bit is like really bothering me now. And so I, I said, well, when you get home, you know, have, have your wife take a picture and, and send it to me. And she did. So this is him now at home. And, it, you know, clearly things are different. I would not have let him go from the clinic without treating him at this point. So I got this picture and we had a phone conversation. Look, let's go ahead and give him some Benadryl, some Zyrtec. And I want to see, you know, another photo in half an hour because obviously they're not with me at that point. So I hang up the phone. I think we have a plan. And then she sends me this a little, about 30 minutes after that. And I think you can appreciate that he's now covered in hives um, or whelps and he is really itchy and I was surprised when I got this photo because we were treating him with Benadryl and, and whatever antihistamine that they had there. I can't remember if it was Allegra or Zyrtec, but so I, I called her right back and I said, you know, Sam, I'm really surprised. And uh, she said, um, well, I wanted to see what would happen. So she didn't treat him at all. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, they're still married, I think, um, yeah. but it, it, and he was, he never had trouble breathing. He was, it never progressed. And so it does show you that not all allergic reactions end up in anaphylaxis, but, um, this was uh, definitely a, a severe one. And I learned that, you know, you really can't always let people go, uh, so quickly. This was another participant who came in and, and she did the same challenge and basically 
I keep her photos because at two hours, she looked at me and said, I think I'm wasting your time. And then almost four hours in, she basically had full anaphylaxis where you have hives and itching and she had gastrointestinal distress and, and she re required a, a shot of epinephrine. Um, and this I included because I learned that if you're really interested in a body part, you should make sure you include it in the before photos. And it's the palms. The palms are really important in the alpha-gal syndrome uh, reactions. A lot of patients will say it's the first place that starts to itch them. Uh, and this is the before photo. This is um, as her reaction starts. I think you can appreciate, even though I cut them off here, uh, that her palms were the first spot then she got this hive in the inside of her elbow, and then she starts to flush and gets hives everywhere. And um, these reactions, so they can progress despite there literally being nothing at two hours. And that was a big change in the way we, we currently think about food allergy in particular. So more pictures from her. This is another gentleman who did the food challenge with, with pork sausage. And Again, four hours, 25 minutes in, he finally gets hives and itching on his flank. Uh, and you can see his alpha-gal blood test number was 29. And the first gentleman I showed you was 9.3. So it turns out that the number itself doesn't correlate to severity. So we kind of learned that during the, during the challenges as well. So I'm, I bring this picture back because of what I'm going to show you next, which and I, in this picture what I the point I want to make now is that in these vesicles where the histamine is stored and there's other mediators in here too there are these green things and this is what we call CD63 which turns out it's it's a glycoprotein that's in the vesicle and it becomes really useful scientifically because as the reaction gets triggered then these vesicles fuse with the external membrane to release histamine and other inflammatory mediators. But you can see the CD63 here, it now appears on the external membrane. So it makes a great marker for us for activation. So at resting state, you don't detect much CD63, but during a response, you do. And, it, and it, so it becomes that marker. And I told you, we took blood every hour from these folks, right? We put the IV in, and this is looking at the CD63% positive. It tends to be on basophils, which are circulating allergy cells in the blood. And these are our food challenge numbers. And you can see, literally, there's no CD63 early on. And then some people, it starts to peak around three hours. And other people, it takes like five to six hours. So it really starts to mirror what the patients were telling us, that nothing happens right away. For some people, it's close to six hours. For others, it's three hours. And their basophils seem to, to really mirror that. So as the, as the story goes on, then I want to show you a little bit about how we start to find more and more people with this. So it turns out that, that between 2009, around 2011, there started to become a national blood test. You could send blood from your patient to the main lab that is in um, central Missouri, and they would do the blood test I was showing you those results for. And by asking that central lab for the numbers of tests that they were doing, we were able to kind of, over time, map how many people were becoming identified or, or positive. So you can see, not only is it these Eastern and Southeastern states, but it also seems that over time, it kind of grows to the, mid, to the Midwest, or at least to the Central US. And then there is some, of course, in the Northeast too. So there's this increasing awareness of people detecting folks that have this alpha-gal allergy and also increasing numbers. And now there's this map. If you just type in ZMAP alpha-gal, 
to your browser, you can get this sort of worldwide view that it's called where in the world is AlphaGal. And this is basically crowdsourced data where people go in and kind of drop their own pin and just sort of say like, yeah, I have AlphaGal allergy. So it is definitely in the US, but you can see that Europe is having trouble with it. South Africa, Australia was an early site of, of awareness as well. So it's, it is global. We think we know the ticks that cause it in the US, and in each place, there seems to be culprit ticks that are involved in this, but it's, real, it's, it's not just one tick. We know that because these, these species are different in different spots. So this is, um, I downloaded this August of last year, so there are probably even more now. But I just want you to sort of take this mental image of where the cases are you can also, if you recall the maps that Camille was showing, you can start to think about, you know, which ticks might really be important. Sometimes patients will, or I shouldn't say patients, sometimes people who upload their data will give you a, a good, like a really helpful story. Undiagnosed until 2011, after four anaphylaxis episodes in one month, problems intermittently, 1996 to, to 2010. But then this is my favorite. This sucks with the, the, the sad face. So we can get some really helpful information from this. Others is just people kind of basically raising their hand and saying that they have it too. Recently, with this summer, this past summer, this map that, that Camille showed as well came out. And this is work uh, that we've done with the CDC to, to try to map as many cases as we could and really quantify those. So there were 110,000 positives in this report. And you can see the, the, the counties where there are you know, greater than 87 suspected, and you can see where it, it tends to mirror the crowdsourced data from where in the world is AlphaGal. There's a couple of interesting things that came out of this work. One was the number of cases. We had no idea that there were 100,000 plus. The CDC estimates that there's probably closer to half a million based on where allergists are, who can get care, who seeks care, that type of thing. But the other things were in this area, uh, the tick experts don't think that these Lone Star ticks are there. We definitely have Lone Star ticks, and that tends to be the most populous tick that we have. But it's not clear that these areas have it, and that there, so there may be other ticks that cause this. The other thing we found was that that is Suffolk County, Long Island, and 4% of all the cases that were reported came out of one county in Long Island. So there are these hot spots where one tick bite really may make a, really may cause an allergy where, where in other areas, a tick bite may cause no response, that, right? That question came up earlier. So this is, I really wanted you to see the known distribution of the Lone Star tick. And then as it compares to the map, because it, it really makes this compelling argument, at least for us in the, in the US, that this tick does seem to drive the IgE response that we detect in AlphaGal. The problem is, you can imagine, right? Like, how do you say scientifically, people go in the woods, right? They get a tick bite, they get mosquito bites, poison ivy, poison oak. How, how do you do a study where you really feel comfortable that, okay, your maps overlap, but come on, you go in the woods. It, you could, it could be any number of exposures that are happening. And, and one way to do that, right, is you just ask people, if you get a tick bite, you know, let me know and we'll take some blood work from you. And if you develop uh, an allergy to red meat, then we'll be able to sort of quantify that for you. That's a lot of work on a case by case basis. So here's one where it worked. This is a, this is the IgE response, right? I, you're, you're now picking up why I, I hit on the IgE stuff so much because allergists love IgE, but the, the orange circles here is the, um, the alpha-gal specific IgE. 
And this patient came to my clinic after a bad reaction at a July 4th barbecue. So we tested her on July 10th and she had uh, IgE to alpha-gal. So we made the diagnosis and basically enrolled her in an observational study where, look, if you get any more tick bites, please let me know. We're not, we're not want, we don't want that for you, but if it happens again, let us know. And she was working in the yard uh, over Labor Day weekend and had uh, you know, 50 plus bites from larval ticks. And I include this picture here because it's hard. Not everyone knows larval ticks can go by the name seed tick or turkey tick. They can be incredibly small, like poppy seed small. And I think sometimes what we call chiggers are, or could be seed tick bites. So just keep an open mind about what's a seed tick versus what's a chigger bite. And she had so many bites. This is not her foot, but that's what it looked like, basically. And so then, you know, she gets all these, these seed tick bites, and we take blood every few weeks for a couple of, of time points, and you see this nice rise in the alpha-gal IgE, and then it starts to go back down. It's, it's kind of an elegant experiment that you would never ask someone to do, but it's a really hard experiment to do. That is to collect enough data and enough time points of people over you know, a, a period of years or months or years to, to really prove that tick bites can do it. And so basically we felt like it probably needed an observational study, which I'm gonna show you a little bit of data from that. I include this here just to remind you that when the Lone Star ticks, when the ladies lay the eggs, they're, they talk about an egg mass and you can literally get hundreds of bites if you walk or brush by the wrong leaf at the wrong time and your, your ankles could look like the, the picture before. So I think we often feel like tick bites happen with an attached adult tick that you see and pull out with tweezers, but a lot of people get bites from these tiny little baby ticks and you get a bunch of bites at once. So, there is a, a group from Japan that was also working on this. And what they found was that the alpha-gal IgE level uh, shown on this axis versus the number of new tick bites on the x-axis, you can appreciate that the more bites you have, it seems like it drives your alpha-gal response. But again, this is circumstantial data. So we enrolled people in Chatham County for a case control study. And we had roughly 100 cases and about 200 controls. And over time, what we were able to show, we asked everyone this detailed questionnaire that those who were case patients, um, so 88% of our case patients had reported finding a tick bite on their body in the past year before symptom onset. Only 47% of the controls did. So the odds ratio was 11. Um, and this was really the first study to kind of, in a, in a longitudinal way, establish this idea that, in a, that tick bites could really, in fact, cause this allergic response, in, as opposed to just kind of piecemeal data here and there from collecting over time. But what we didn't know is if you test positive, but don't really have any episodes of your allergic reactions, does that mean that you may develop the allergy over time if you get more bites? So we're following these people over time to see about that. A lot of times people ask, how long does the tick have to be attached? Also, you can imagine a tough study to do, right? They just leave it on, let's, let's see what happens. And we don't do that. Um, one of the other things we asked was, do you have anyone in your family that has this this allergic reaction to red meat. And so a, a lot of people actually said yes, but unfortunately we didn't ask, are you related to that person? Like, is it your blood relative? Do they live with you? Or is it some distant uncle in Suffolk County, Long Island? So we don't know if the risk is one of genetics or is it the family that hikes together and camps together and gets bitten by the same tick. So we have more to come on the what is my risk portion of the story. 
And then I just wanted um, to to say a few things about the from kind of the medical side of this, right? You're we're here in mini med school, so you know we think about I call it AGS or alpha gal syndrome for short. So the phenotypes, how does this present? What does it look like? And the people that came to us originally, they tended to have signs and symptoms, right? Signs are things that we can see, right? So you have vomiting, that's a sign. You're flushing, you have, you have hives. Symptoms are abdominal pain that I, as a physician, can't see, but I trust that you're telling me you have this symptom. So signs and symptoms from red meat, particularly fatty forms of red meat. Some of these people will tolerate dairy, others will not. So some people can have cheese pizza and ice cream, but many of them cannot. So they tend to present with itching, hives, swelling. This is our nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, hypotension, so loss of blood pressure, anaphylaxis, which is the medical term for severe allergic reaction. Technically, if you have two organ systems involved, and I'll define that for you in a second, then you can, you can be diagnosed as having anaphylaxis. So you could technically have hives on your skin and vomiting, and that would be cutaneous for your skin and then gastrointestinal for vomiting, and if you've ingested a, a, an allergen, then that's technically anaphylaxis. Now, not in that scenario, not everyone is going to receive epi, epinephrine or an EpiPen, but in theory, you, you could certainly, if your symptoms were intractable, um, so just a, a, a slight point of, of take home, perhaps, about anaphylaxis. Then a few years later, we started to hear about patients who fall in this category of gastrointestinal or GI only. So they don't get itching or hives or swelling. They don't get the things that would typically lead you to the allergist office. These are patients who end up actually in the gastrointestinal um, specialist office. And um, we've, we've got a couple of experts here at UNC. Sarah McGill is definitely the leading expert as when it comes to isolated gastrointestinal alpha-gal meat allergy. So these patients tend to have abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea. In fact, in the case series that she published, nine of them met criteria, criteria for diarrhea-predominant irritable bowel syndrome. And it was interesting because they, they report the same like awakening at night. So it's, it is delayed. It tends to not be quite as delayed as the patients that get hives or itching, but it's delayed. They'll wake up in the middle of the night with GI distress. Doesn't happen every time. Interestingly, none of the patients in, in her group had reported, ha had associated their gastrointestinal symptoms with eating red meat. So it was one of those things where you kind of have to be prodded or, or prompted to think about it. Um, but 75% of the folks were called a tick bite. So there is a delay, as you might imagine, from symptom onset to diagnosis because it's not readily apparent that this is what you have. So almost two years in, in delay. For folks who are really interested in this and want more information, I think this alphagalinformation.org is a great uh, site to you know give some 101 stuff and then has a little bit more about how what it takes to kind of live with alpha gal syndrome for those of you who are who want to do even more reading there's a great new york times magazine article you, you like the, the sad face with meat um <laughs> but uh Mo moses uh, did a great article i think and talked to a lot of people um about uh, alpha gal allergy and other other vector related things as well so this is available online. It's from a couple of years ago, but it's still available um, for those that are interested. One of the one of the hallmarks of this alpha gal allergy is that many of the people who get tick bites and then go on to develop the meat allergy is that the spot where they're bitten 
they get this red, itchy, inflamed area. It's slow to heal. It may start out like this. This would be the early response. But then this is the tends to be the late response. So after two or three days, and, and this redness can last for weeks, some people will say months, that, that the spot where the tick bite was will bother them, persistently itchy, slow to heal, be inflamed. Some patients will even say, which I think is fascinating, and I told you about the palms as like an early sign of you eat a hamburger. Some of them will say when they eat meat, the first place that itches is the site of the prior bite, um, which is fascinating and probably means that there's some allergy cells there in the skin that we need to think about. But I also thought it would be, I would be remiss as an allergist thinking about the outdoors and things that happen um, without telling you a little bit about, you know, bees and wasps um, in terms of outdoor health. But I think the important. The library will be closing in 30 minutes at 8 o'clock. If you need assistance, please be a staff member now. Okay. Um, Again, the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 8 o'clock. That includes all the meeting rooms and the restroom okay. and the lobby. Thank you. The skin is critical to making an allergic response. We see this over and over again. Things that happen to the skin often lead to this IgE, which you now know as an allergic response. So while the skin is important here in the tick bite story, uh, it's also obviously the site of where we get stung. So honeybees um, tend to make this type of, of nest, right? We, we say it's a vertical comb um, I think most of us can recognize honeybees fairly well. But, you know, other aphids include the, the bumblebee uh, here, not aggressive, usually don't sting. Um, sweat bee, shown there on the right, very few reactions. We don't really see very many patients um, that have allergic reactions to sweat bees. Bumblebee, we can see. Fortunately, they're, they're not reactive with honeybee. So if you're allergic to honeybee, then it doesn't necessarily mean that you're bothered by the other aphids. Vespids are yellow jackets, hornets, and wasps. And their, their stingers are shown here. They hurt if you've been stung. And, and you, know, you can appreciate why now, because it's barbed. The stingers are barbed. And, I think nothing reminds you how much it hurts until you've been stung recently. Um, these are yellow jackets. And this yellow jackets tend to make their nests in the ground. And the truth is, if you're ever stung by something like bee, wasp, hornet, I wouldn't worry about collecting it and bringing it to us or taking a picture. We're going to test you for the things that we would need to know about in the area where you live. So this is really just more of a, of a for information. But yellow jackets are, are ground nesters. They're aggressive. Um, and hornets, they're both yellow hornet and white-faced, or sometimes called bald-faced hornets. They're extremely aggressive around their nest. This is when you see people in the cartoon being chased, right? That's hornets that are chasing them. And the hornet nest really looks like it's this sort of paper mache, right? And it can be, you know, this is just in a field. Um, and they are incredibly sensitive in the nest, even to vibration. So lawn mowers and power tools of that sort can, can set off hornets to to go after you. Paper wasps tend to have this really narrow waist. I, you know, I don't think anyone's getting close enough to these things to like look at the waist, uh, but or taking in-flight pictures to see that their their legs dangle when they're flying. They're not as aggressive, and often I think this is when people don't know what has stung them. It tends to be paper wasps because they don't really have a the same sort of coloring over and over again. They can be brown, black, red, striped, et cetera, um, perhaps a little bit uh, more difficult to, 
to recognize and and this this is the typical kind of nest like I think about under a picnic table under you can be in shrubs um, it's kind of the single layer open uh, combs would be a, a paper wasp nest. So we have increasingly imported fire ants in North Carolina, particularly in Eastern North Carolina, but, but more and more we're seeing folks with, with fire ant allergy around here as well. Um, I don't think these are kind of any mystery, right? This is the typical nest. Uh, that's what the imported fire ant looks like. And they make pustules. So this is, is what the fire ant, um, they, they, they kind of raise a circle the way that they, they bite. They, it's less of a sting, but they kind of march around almost in a, in a tiny circle and that's what raises the pustule. So it's a little different. The, um, then I, I wanted to finish, looks like we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, I wanted to finish with a few more, just maybe these are random thoughts about skin and allergy. I'm giving you fun things to tell your friends and family. Um, so again, this, this idea of something happening to the skin, there's a really interesting story in Japan. They, in, they eat a fermented bean paste there called natto. And there is, you know, we, the more we think about this tick bite meat allergy, we start to think about things where stuff happens to the skin and then we get this allergic response. Because if we weren't really eating red meat, we wouldn't really know about the alpha-gal thing. But in Japan, some of the dermatologists actually started to find um, people who were reacting to the fermented bean paste natto, and they started to wonder if it wasn't due to jellyfish stings, right? So again, something, something happening to the skin with an IgE response that then cross-reacts to something in, in food. So it turns out that the risk factor for getting this is surfing. These were all surfers who surf at this local spot and they get they get jellyfish stings and they become allergic to natto. And this is actually skin tests. I, I mean, now you know what skin tests are doing. So this is uh, the control saline there. That's the histamine positive. This is chop suey, chili oil, right? Those are both negative. Jellyfish, that's positive. Shark fin soup was negative. I'm sure I don't know how to say that, but it was negative. This is a picture of the jellyfish. I mean, clearly, uh, why you would surf, you know, I, the, the waves must be incredible there. Um, and then this is a picture of a patient who had any, a, a number of jellyfish stings. So it's, it's gonna be interesting to see, I think as time goes on, where this comes up more and more, this idea of something happens to the skin and then we develop an allergic response that then shows up in various places. The next one I wanted to tell you about, I think this is the last bit, but again, women applying a, a cosmetic soap that has a, a derivative of wheat to their face and uh, particularly I think in Japan, we're then developing a, meat, a wheat allergy after using a cosmetic that had um, a wheat allergen in it. And this is actually, it, it's a, like this striking increase in the number of patients reported monthly who have this, who were using this cosmetic facial soap over time uh, and developing a wheat allergy. And then this is the, the you know, the timeline basically um, for, for people between 2014, 2012 and 2014, there was this sort of striking increase in um, reported cases. I think it's, it is now awareness is, has increased. And so the, the, the number of cases has started to decline, but um, yeah. And this is just the age group of the, 
the folks who were um, mainly uh, females in the red bars and then males on, in the blue bars who were diagnosed with this cosmetic soap-induced wheat allergy. Um, so I think that's a fair amount of information. I'll stop there. Uh, happy to take any questions. And I do have some EpiPens up here. They're, they're all live, so we don't want to... Um, we don't want to inject ourselves. I forgot the grapefruit to uh, to let us inject, but I am happy to to show anyone who wants to see how to use an an auto injector. But thank you for your attention. I assume we're talking about meat allergy, not natto or, <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. So the question was, are we basically now recognizing this alpha-gal syndrome or, or has it been around for a minute? I, I think there's, the, it's probably twofold, the answer. There clearly are more cases now because we're seeing in the UNC Allergy Clinic eight to 10 new cases a week. And these are not newly not people who are just now coming to get diagnosed. They're, they're new onset. So like six months ago, they started having reactions, not someone who said, I'm finally ready to get my blood drawn and, and get a diagnosis. So I think there is a component of this that's completely new and probably relates to the fact that there's more and more ticks out there. Maybe also that people are getting outside because we're telling them, go be healthy, walk your trails, et cetera, et cetera. But there definitely are people who have had the alpha-gal allergy for years. And we hear about this from time to time. Someone will say, look, I've had it for 20 or 30 years before you even had a blood test for it or were doing skin testing. I, I was bothered by red meat. And then maybe they have a tick history too. So there's some of both. There, there have been cases undoubtedly prior to us having a blood test and, and being able to diagnose it but it, I also think it's also on the rise. But yeah, good, good Zoom question. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, so you mentioned the blood group type. Have you, and the overlap is different. Have you found any? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I mentioned that and I didn't end up putting the data in, so I apologize. But yes, it, well, it took a while. It turns out when you work with blood types and blood groups, you have to have a large number that you sample. And what we found over time is that if you're B or AB, you still get it, but it's about half as much. So in the, in, in the US, particularly in the Southeast, blood type B and AB are both around 7%, just taking all comers. And in our groups, we see, so you would think 15% roughly of, of the alpha-gal allergic diagnosed people should be that, and we see it about 7%. So it's about half as much as you would anticipate, yeah. So it may be that there really is some amount of protection, so to speak. And, and the thought there is just that if you, as someone who might have blood type B, have an alpha-gal linkage, on your cells, you might, your immune system might be less likely to make a response that would cross react with your own cells, right? You should edit from an immune system standpoint, that should be edited out. And, and, and it may be that that's actually what's happening. What's your second question? My second question was, so before you talked about the wheat and NATO uh, allergens, I was curious what aspect of tick biology, like what leads are there on like either glands in the tick or mouse in the tick that might have overlap. Yeah, why does the tick do this? And why in some cases does it seem like it's a really specific tick? It turns out that the ticks seem to carry, at least in the Lone Star tick, um, they carry alpha-gal in their saliva. It's on some of their, their fat and protein molecules. And 
obviously the natural question would be why in the world would a tick have alpha gal? So since we as humans don't, we're not really, we're not a natural host for, for ticks, but deer and dogs and mice, they're natural hosts for ticks. And it turns out that tick saliva apparently evolves very quickly. So if you're a tick and you're looking to latch on to a, a dog or a deer, if you express alpha-gal, which those animals have, then those animals' immune response see the tick as self, as containing alpha-gal. And so they don't then basically fight the tick off, right? So it, I think the, the current thought is that the ticks have evolved some alpha-gal expression to facilitate feeding on animals like deer or dog. As humans, and you've seen, uh, we've seen now the, the response that we can get in the skin of patients who develop this allergy, it can be a brisk one. And, and <laughs> the library building will be closing in 15 minutes at eight o'clock. If you need staff assistance, please see a staff member. The meeting room, the restroom, the whole entire library building will be closing at 8 p.m. Yeah. So yeah, that's 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 why we think. Sure. Any implications for the group that you have? Do they have a common other issue, meaning immune deficiency, or you know something else that has nothing to do with the tip? Yeah, it's a great question, and the short answer is no. In fact, when you look, when we look at all of our cohort, so to speak, about 50% of the diagnosed patients would say that they have allergies. And half would say, I've never had a reason to go to an allergist. So even that basic of, a, of an underlying commonality, we don't see it. Um, yeah, we've looked long and hard to figure out what it is about, what's the real risk, and is, could there be some underlying thing? We haven't found it yet. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you're working. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, and, and agreed. And that's where, in some ways, the tick story is kind of intellectually satisfying because it gives you a reason why, why you yeah. develop it. But yeah, we had the same questions because I'm telling you the story with the tick history, but we didn't know about the tick bite part early on. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you.